Infinite Opportunities helps you learn more about the wide range of enriching opportunities at Pennsylvania's 14 state system universities. This week, we focus on research opportunities available at universities across the state system. But first, we'll hear from Indiana University of Pennsylvania's President, Michael Driscoll. Hello, I'm Frank Brogan, Chancellor of the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. We're going to have the opportunity to speak with one of our campus leaders who's with us and hear a little bit about not only Indiana University, but how Indiana plays a very important role in our entire system and for that matter, the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and beyond. With us today is Dr. Michael Driscoll. Dr. Driscoll is the president of Indiana University. He is the 26th president with a long history at Indiana University. He has a personal great and long history in higher education, serving in a variety of administrative capacities, including most recently before he moved to Indiana as provost of another institution of higher ed. So we're delighted to have you with us today, Dr. Driscoll. And can you start by telling us a little bit about the rich history of IUP and how it's gotten to be part of the bedrock of our higher education system? Well, thank you, Chancellor Brogan, for this chance to chat about my favorite topic, which is IUP. IUP was founded in 1875 as a local normal school to educate teachers. In um, 1965, we were granted university status and began offering our first doctoral programs. And if you fast forward to today, we have about 14,350 students with programs from baccalaureate to PhD in a broad range of disciplines and areas. Indiana is located about an hour's drive from downtown Pittsburgh in the beautiful hills uh, surrounding the town we have some of the historic coal reserves of the commonwealth but perhaps more interest lately is that we're right in the middle of the Marcellus Shale region so we've seen a lot of changes in the economy lately and IUP is certainly well engaged in that so I would just say long tradition of serving our students well lots of interaction between high quality faculty and students in the classroom out of the classroom in the community big part of uh, your location, as I like to remind people, is your proximity to Puxatani. And what an exciting opportunity to be within hailing distance of one of the best known locations in all of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Absolutely, although some of us are a little upset with Phil right now in the weather. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that, that IUP, with its primary facility in Indiana, also has facilities in Punxsutawney. We've been there for a long time at North Point in Armstrong County, and we also have a facility in Monroeville just outside of Pittsburgh. So we try to serve the entire region, bringing our high quality education to those very specific locations as well as the, the core in Indiana. You're an academic uh, part of our community in a unique way. You had touched on this a moment ago in that so many of our universities offer baccalaureate degrees and master's degree with growing portfolio in the area of doctoral degrees. But for so many years, Indiana has a proud tradition of doctoral degree granting programs. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to head up a university that has that sort of broad swath of academic and degree offerings? Well, I, I think that's a great question. And the first thing that I would highlight is this means that our faculty are actively engaged in research. They are moving ahead in the state of knowledge, in the application of knowledge in their specific disciplines. But there's something special about the teacher-scholar model that our faculty practice at IUP and that is that they bring that high quality research directly to our students. You're not going to be in a classroom with a teaching assistant giving you the instruction. You're going to be working with that world-class researcher who's bringing that to you as a student and also you're going to have a chance to maybe work with that professor in the lab, write a new paper, get it published, be out there. Our students as undergraduates regularly present at national academic conferences and one of my favorites is a young woman in chemistry who recently won the best paper award in San Francisco 
as an undergraduate. It was a graduate conference, and she, she won that. She's going on to do great things. That's just one example of that kind of interplay that happens at a doctoral research university that's unique, and we are very proud of that fact. Well, having been here for about a year and a half as chancellor, I've been very impressed with so many things. One of the things of which I'm most impressed is how undergraduate research is becoming an important part of what all 14 of our universities do. People stereotypically and understandably believe that research is reserved for a doctoral degree uh, programs or even graduate studies, but more and more across the country, higher education is adopting the research model within undergraduate education, and I know you're doing work in that. Uh, I, I, th I think it's important for everyone to recognize, maybe remember, that when they learned the best, it was when they were actively engaged, excited, and motivated. And there's nothing more engaging than sitting down with a new problem. Maybe no one knows the answer to the problem, and you're being asked to engage in that work with professionals who are experts in the area. Nothing is more exciting. And I think that's an important part of why we work hard to provide experiences for our students in the classroom, but also out of the classroom. Whether it's a leadership opportunity or it's in a laboratory, we want folks to be practicing what they're learning to get that excitement to really reinforce the lessons. Well, one of the things I really admire about you is your focus on student life. Uh, having been a president and working now with 14 others, uh, you can't eff emphasize the world of student life enough, that experience that a student has from the time they walk into one of our universities until the time they walk off that graduation stage. Talk a little bit about student life as a very important part of the future of IUP. First, I have to talk about our facilities as I talk about student life. Certainly where you live and work has an impact on the quality of your experience. We, in the last 10 years, have replaced our old student dormitories with new suite-based living. We called it residential revival. Students love that. We have about 4,000 of our 14,000 plus students living on campus. Those facilities are the basis for what we call living learning communities where students, maybe they're in nursing, are all living on the same floor. So they're studying together, going to class together, helping each other out, and also learning how to work with other people, which is a, is a key part of success in the world today. You have to have the, the book learning and you have to have the skills that you get in the classroom, but you also have to be able to work in a team of people to do the right thing and move ahead. And, and that's one of the key things that we do. We engage our students in housing, but in other ways, whether it's a fraternity or sorority, providing leadership on campus, whether it's intercollegiate athletics, uh, intramural athletics, whether it's the chance that you have to be part of a student club or opportunity to be a leader in that area, or again, back to the fundamental, maybe you're going to do some interesting library research in Europe as part of our study abroad program. Again, bringing those real world experiences in. You touched on this earlier and that was the concept of what I call going over the wall of higher education. Not only uh, taking care of business on campus but also getting faculty and students outside of the university to practice what we preach on campus, give people an opportunity uh, to engage in their work elsewhere for the broader community, and I know IUP has a long, rich tradition in that regard. I, I think that's, that's wonderful. I like to talk about universities not having walls, and in fact that uh, we provide this wonderful opportunity for our students, but we also bring their expertise to places that need it. We have, for at least the last four years, been on uh, the U.S. President's honor roll for community service, which says that our students are out there. Well, maybe they're working for a local agency. Maybe they're doing an internship at a bank or in another business that gives them the opportunity to walk out the door in a, into a great job, but they're also providing real value to the community while they're studying and still learning. And that's something that a university can provide and that we're strongly dedicated to both in the area right around Indiana, but across Pennsylvania, across the country, and we have students that have served around the world. 
Well, I'm very impressed by the visioning that you're doing at IUP, the knowledge that as great as has the history of IUP been, its next 20 years is being developed right now as we speak, and the work that you are all doing in creating strategic visioning for the university, academic programs, the facility needs of the future, the, that's all been very uh, impressive to me. And tell us a little bit about how you're working with the people at IUP to develop that vision. One of the things I'm very, very proud of within this is that as we look to the future and try to determine as a community what we needed to focus on, we didn't turn to an expensive consulting firm to come in and write the strategic plan for us, to build our vision for us, but I turned to students in our journalism department, led by a faculty member, and I said, I want hundreds of people involved in this process. I want to hear what people are thinking about our future, and they took it up and did it. So they took a class that was going to go left, and they sort of went right with this opportunity. They spent a lot of time on it. And we ended up with a final um, uh, count of probably around 1,000 people engaged in the process in various ways. And about 400 people from the community, from campus, came to a wrap-up summit to help us finalize where we thought we were going. And those were facilitated sessions by students. And so that's another great example of this real learning that's happening at IUP. Now, within that, we recognize that we need to make sure that we're continuing to provide those academic programs that meet the needs of Western Pennsylvania, of Pennsylvania, and faculty members push me to say, and the world beyond. And we're really trying to do that. We just had approved in December uh, five new tracks in our College of Business to address the energy industry, energy management, finance for energy, and that's just the beginning of a number of new opportunities that we have coming related to what are clearly the needs of Western Pennsylvania, but that will grow beyond that. We want to make sure that our students have jobs where they want to live, jobs that meet the needs of Pennsylvania, so that we're not bringing in somebody to run our state for us from somewhere else and then take their paycheck home. Well, the history of IUP is so incredibly deep and rich, but it's hard not to get excited about the future of Indiana University. And Dr. Mike Driscoll, thank you so much for spending time with us and our best to the faculty, uh, the students, and the staff of Indiana University. Thank you very much. Coming up next, explore more opportunities offered at the universities in Pennsylvania's state system of higher education. Welcome back to Infinite Opportunities. Next, we go to Westchester University to discover how students research literature in forms ranging from handwritten manuscripts to digital readers. Book history, an ever-growing interdisciplinary field that examines the history of the written word in all its forms, from clay tablets to scrolls, medieval manuscripts, hand-printed books, magazines, newspapers, and e-books. As this brief look at student projects will illustrate, the creation, production, distribution, and reception of the written word is a field rich in history, human activity, aesthetic sensibilities, technological change, and cultural significance, as well as much, much more. In English 270, students study the evolution of the written word from medieval manuscripts to its electronic transformations of present day. In doing so, they study the histories of authorship, reading, and publishing, as well as subfields such as censorship and literacy. What they gain in the process is an eye-opening understanding of the book in similar written forms, not only as cultural artifacts, but also cultural agents. The research projects undertaken by English 270 students represent the breadth and diversity of book history and the ways in which this field's vibrancy stems in part 
from the dialogue it constructs between past media revolutions and our current digital age. Today, books are printed at the touch of a few buttons, but in the past, assembly was a much more complicated process that involved skillful hands, special materials, and countless days of corrections. Medieval manuscripts are the epitome of this craft, and the Book of Kells, a large gospel book created by monks in medieval Ireland, particularly demonstrates what some consider the fine art of assembling and preparing a manuscript for viewing and treasuring pleasures over reading comprehension. To understand this art, I researched a manuscript's value in medieval times in terms of labor and cultural worth, the, in the intricate procedure to make them, including Kells, and the emotional effect still created on readers and viewers today. English 270 presented me with a lot of fascinating opportunities for a final project. I was especially taken with the class session held at Aurelia Press in which we observed the intricate art of hand printing. The same attention to painstaking detail, labor, and artistic form that characterized the hand press drew me to work on constructing the publication history of Jack Kerouac's On the Road, and the ways in which the novel's editors and its public reception transformed the text beyond Kerouac's original vision. So Lauren, after all the work of setting the type, putting the type in the press, inking up the press, we finally arrived at that moment where we can print the type. And that's what we've done. Authorial intent is manipulated and shaped by a variety of outside sources. By its completion, a text is not simply a work of the author, but a result of a unique and collaborative process into a work of literature. The spread of new forms of media are often perceived to be threatening by some, and comic books prove to be no different. My research on the censorship of comic books in the era known as post-war America highlighted the social, cultural, and political movements that led to the creation and implementation of the comic book codes. In examining the impact this system of censorship had on the culture of comic books and their publishing, I illustrated that the controversy surrounding the censorship of comic books demonstrates their significance as vessels of culture, ultimately proving their rightful and integral place in the study of book history. As a future educator in the field of literature, I view keeping up with publishing trends and reading habits as necessary to teach literature in the modern age. Plus, my own interest in writing professionally means that keeping up with how the publishing industry is changing today can help me get published tomorrow. So I undertook a project that asked whether the e-book was the kiss of death or the breath of life. What my studies found is that the e-book is not transforming readers into electronic readers, but rather it's diversifying the readers into both traditional and electronic readers. The e-books have developed a growth in readership by complimenting the book. Beth's, Dan's, Lauren's, and Chris's projects offer just a sampling of the very fine research undertaken in this course and at Westchester Center for Book History. These projects demonstrate not only the immense richness of book history, but also the ways in which this field helps us to navigate the digital transformations marking our own society. We would like to invite those across campus as well as those in the community to join us in research and intellectual exchange at our Center for Book History. Coming up next, explore more opportunities offered at the universities in Pennsylvania's state system of higher education. Welcome back to Infinite Opportunities. Next, we go to Millersville University to learn more about Made in Millersville. I'm the Director of Sponsored Programs and Research Administration for Millersville University. I'm in the Division of Academic Affairs. The Made in Millersville event is a showcase for student scholarly and creative work. The idea is to bring students in from across the university, whether they're in the performing arts or the visual arts, whether they're in chemistry or biology or the humanities or social sciences, and get them to show the work that they're doing as part of class projects or as part of independent research projects. My involvement with Made in Millersville is as a coordinator for the entire 
program. I sit as essentially a committee chair, and the committee is made up of faculty and staff from across the university. So they're in charge of coming up with the ideas and determining how they want the program to run and how they want it to look. And my job is to sort of make that vision happen. Well, my project is about the research needs for wildlife law enforcement officers. Poaching is the second reason for a biodiversity loss. Being a biology major, I understand that it's a really good biology department that we have here. And just looking at the different projects around here in Maiden Millersville, you can see that there's a lot of other cool things going on, like art projects that I would have never even known about if I hadn't even come to Maiden Millersville in the first place. I wrote a screenplay, so it's being read out loud by the um, theater group. I signed up for Broadcast Workshop 2, which is uh, where you write a 65-page screenplay by the end of the year. So I finished Act 1 and Act 2, and uh, Dr. Irwin came up to us as a class and asked if anybody would be willing to participate in it, and I said yes. My project was called Resonant Circuitry, the Innovations and Advancements in Electroacoustic Percussion. And how I got involved in Made in Millersville was through the Music Research Fellowship. It's a group of uh, music majors that came together, I guess, a couple semesters ago, and we built a curriculum for ourselves, about a three-semester curriculum, in which we learned to be peer mentors and peer educators using the library's resources to be able to help out other students, but then to also use that knowledge and apply it to our own uh, self-motivated research projects. Millersville creates independent thinkers. That's one of the goals on all my syllabi, to teach students to apply the scientific method. But in order to do that, we try to encourage them to keep an open mind and to really think critically about how to devise an experiment. It's a great school because the faculty are very good and the faculty are passionate about teaching and about providing students with good experiences in the classroom and in the laboratory or in the field or whatever the, the other um, sort of extracurricular activity might be. It also benefits you know, the students by helping them develop a bond to the university and a bond to their department and their major and their programs. Coming up next, explore more opportunities offered at the universities in Pennsylvania's state system of higher education. Slippery Rock was my first choice. My best choice. Because they had what I wanted to study. What I wanted to study. I love my major. I love the professors. It's so much more. So much more than a class. There's a tradition of success. Leadership. Community service. Helping me through my major and bringing about success for my future. Slippery Rock is showing me the world. The Rock prepared me for my job. Slippery Rock University. Experience the difference. Welcome back to Infinite Opportunities. Next, we go to Bloomsburg University to learn how the local community can benefit from students' sociology research. And what we're doing is we're surveying residents of the town. It's a uh, community research project based in the Elm Street community of uh, Berwick. Well, we have a total of five students involved. We have one student who's the lead researcher, and he's really doing most of the legwork and organizing in collaboration with me. The five students are all out door to door doing the data collection. Then they'll collaborate on the analysis, but our lead student will be responsible for making sure everything comes together into a coherent picture in the end. It's always great to, uh, to interact with people, I feel, especially in, in any part of any community, but it's, it's uh, I think it'll be valuable gaining this experience of, of overseeing a team of students working underneath me. BU is a great resource to us. Um, Heather and, and her folks have, have been wonderful throughout this whole process. We know if we need something, we can call Heather. We're lucky enough to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to do things like this, and this is for the betterment of the, of the community, so it's a real opportunity to be able to work on this. Coming up next, explore more opportunities offered at the universities in Pennsylvania's state system of higher education.
Welcome back to Infinite Opportunities. Next, we go to Lock Haven University to learn more about researching the cause of a devastating disease in the bat population. I am currently researching white nose syndrome in bats. It's a fungus called Pseudogymnoascus destructans, and bats are very important. Uh, they're a keystone species, and bats meet millions of pounds of insects per summer. And white nose syndrome has killed about 90% of our bats in the Northeast. There needs to be a management strategy with, with white nose syndrome. This, this was all driven by LHU students in 2010 when I was teaching mycology. My students kept asking about white nose syndrome. And one of the things we do in class is we isolate fungi from the environment. And so the students begged me to get them a bat. And so I got a bat. We isolated the culture, we sequenced it, and found that we could isolate geomyces really easily. The game commission started asking us to collaborate with them, and so we've been collaborating since 2010, and, and the idea, the chemical control that we're actually uh, using, um, it's in toxicity trials in St. Louis. This was a student idea, something that they thought would be non-toxic and, and could work to treat the best. We're gonna be able to see the, the the difference in our white nose syndrome management strategy, like what it's going to do to the caves. Really, since 2010, students have been driving this research. Dylan came in not having done research before in my lab, and um, this is his first real research experience, but he ended up doing so well, even with his wrestling schedule and everything, that he ended up winning second place against students from 11 other schools. CPUB, which is a Commonwealth of Pennsylvania University Biologist Conference, was a really cool experience. It really got me to see what it's like to present my research. There are a lot of professors in the state system of Pennsylvania, our state system schools, Apache schools, that are really passionate about research and that do research with students. And so you can do that at Lock Haven. Um, and you get access to state-of-the-art research equipment. I don't think we would have the same opportunities if we didn't have this facility. And I think a lot of students from other schools don't have the same opportunities we have. Like we have a BX53 microscope, which is a research grade microscope. There's only one of these microscopes at a big school down the road and undergraduates don't get to use it. And so you get to use this if you come to Lock Haven. And we have tons of other microscopes like this one and uh, we have a research grade hood and a nano drop, all these things like I get to use on a daily basis, which really helped me in my research. Basically what students can do is they get all this hands-on experience with equipment and they get to work with their professors and see their professors excited about various research projects. And that really is showing them how to complete research, keep track of data, use scientific equipment, learn how to use the equipment, adjust to different equipment, and then they can put that all together and complete a project. And that's something that an employer wants because an employer is going to train you on whatever equipment they have. And they're going to expect you to be able to follow through, keep track of the information, and then present it in a timely manner, and that's what I'm working with students to teach them. Come back next week to learn more of the infinite opportunities at the state system's 14 universities, or visit us online.